What's the most important ingredient for a successful life? That's a pretty big question. We'll talk about that next weekend, next Sunday, right here at 11.11, oh yeah. Do yourself a favor, do your family a favor, gain some bonus points, come to church two Sundays in a row. I dare you. Hey, it's great to be back in church, isn't it? Isn't it great to be back? I wanna welcome uh, those of you who've been away for a while, so glad you made it here today on this Easter 2021. Today we're joining with billions of Christians around the globe. We're celebrating the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I will say he is risen and you'll respond. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen now, a lot of times I get asked questions during the week and uh, there's some that I would put on my FAQ, frequently asked questions list. And one of those uh, for the past 20 years or so has been this. Someone will come up to me or they'll write me a letter and they'll say, hey, Ben, I want to write a book. What do I need to do? And I'll say, don't, don't write a book. And, and what I mean by this is, is that you don't need to write a book first or write a manuscript because the publishers will not read it. What you need to do is to write a book proposal, which is kind of a summary and outline of your book. And that's what publishers look at. And even, even if you're gonna self-publish, uh, that'll give you some idea and direction on where to go with your work. And the second thing I tell them is this, if you're really serious about writing a book, what you need to do is buy this book called On Writing by Stephen King. Now, obviously, I don't agree with everything Stephen King says, he's a little out there, but when it comes to the craft of how to write, no one is better, in my opinion, than Stephen King. And in this book, yeah, let's clap for Stephen King. Stephen, I hope you get a copy of this. We're clapping for you here in Texas, selling your book here. But in his book, he talks a lot about the craft and the, uh, of writing and how you do it. And one of the things he says is controversial, uh, surrounds the whole idea of plot. He doesn't believe in plotting out your story, your book in advance. For example, you know, Bill Smith is an insurance salesman in Trenton, New Jersey, but he's really working for the CIA at Langley. And at the end of the story, he finds a Russian spy in Paris and kills him. And that's how the story ends. He doesn't do that. He doesn't believe in plotting out a story in advance. And someone asked him, why don't you believe in that? He said, well, our lives are plotless. Your life, my life, they're plotless. No matter how much we pray, prepare, insurance we buy, we can't predict what's going to happen next. So he said, why would I want to write a story or a book or do a movie uh, that, that's boring, that's predictable? Life is plotless. So that kind of begs the question then, Stephen, then how do you do it? How, how do you get going? How do you start writing? Where do these ideas come to you from? He says, basically, they come to me by asking a what if question. Asking a what if question. He says, I believe if I can get a group of characters or a character in a intense situation and watch them try to free themselves from that situation and write that down, they don't have a bestseller. So we ask a what if question. What if vampires invaded a small New England town? Salem's lot, right? What if a mother and her child are stuck in a stalled car with a rabid dog? Cujo. What if, look at this one, an innocent banker is convicted of murder and has to spend the rest of his life in prison? Shawshank Redemption. Find a difficult situation, find some conflict, put a person or a group of people in that conflict and then watch them try to get free and write down what happens. That's how he develops plot. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Let's do that today. Why don't we do that today with the Easter story? 
okay? What if a Jewish teacher died, came back to life, and no one believed it? What if? Because according to the data, that, that's what happened. The story is simple. He was executed on Friday outside of the city. And on Sunday, some said he was alive, breathing, talking, walking around like a normal human being. But people found that really hard to believe years ago. And people find it hard to believe today. Some say, well, you know, he, he didn't really die. He just swooned. Others say the disciples stole the body and made up the story. Some people say, well, he didn't really rise from the dead physically. It's a metaphor and a myth that was added on later. But when you look at the data, his closest followers, those who had left everything to be a part of this brand new revolution, this movement, did not believe that he was alive when they first heard the news. They didn't buy it. They doubted. They flat out disbelieved. When they heard the news, Christ has risen, they said, no, he's not. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. And maybe you're saying, well, I don't believe you. Okay, let's open the Bible. Look at Matthew 28. Resurrected Christ appears to them. Some doubted, some worshiped, others doubted. Mark 16, they heard the news. Hey, they told the disciples, hey, Christ is alive, we've seen him. They did not believe them. Another group came from the road to Emmaus. They said, listen, he was with us on the road to Emmaus. We've seen him, we've talked to him. We sat around the fire with him. The disciples said, we don't believe you either. Then in Luke 24, they came back with the news. He's alive. He's alive from the dead. And what did they say? No, we don't believe. It seems like nonsense to us. And then, of course, in John chapter 20, Thomas, they told him, hey, Thomas, he's alive. We've seen him. We've been with him. Thomas said, listen, no way. I'm not going to believe it until I see him and touch him. I'm not going to believe Why? Because they were human beings just like you and just like me. They had learned at a very young age growing up, just like we have, that dead people don't come back to life. It's that simple. But what happened? Something happened. What happened? What happened to change these Men and women, from cowards to the most courageous people we've ever known. What happened to bring them out of the shadows in their rooms and hiding in fear that they were going to be executed and fear that they would be hunted down and fear that they would have to go to prison? What changed them from huddling together in fear, from going out into the streets, into the city, proclaiming? that he is risen. What changed? Well, what I've seen in my life and a lot of your lives as well, and what I've seen in the Bible story is that many times God meets us where we are to take us where we need to be. So what happened? Many years ago, Peter is sitting around, I don't know, a couple of weeks after the crucifixion. He's sitting around doing nothing. I wonder what this guy's thinking about. Nothing, he's just a guy, he's a guy, you know. Maybe work, maybe sports, it's about as high as we get, you know. No mystery to us. Peter, what is he thinking about? Hey, I'm gonna go fishing. That's what he does. Anybody wanna go with me? He goes fishing, takes his buddies with him. They go out on the boat. They fish all night long. They don't catch anything. They're going in. They're offshore. Guy on the shore goes, hey, have you caught anything? Which is the question you don't want to hear, right? When you struck out, you don't want to hear that question. Have you caught anything? Peter goes, no. 
The guy on shore says, hey, did you try that spot over there? Peter says, whatever. Psh, those are nets over there. They bring in this massive haul of fish, like 152. Peter goes, I know who that is. Jumps out of the boat, swims to shore, goes on shore, and it's Jesus Christ himself. They sit down together, along with his other friends, the disciples, and they make a fire, and they have breakfast, and they talk. Mary Magdalene was in grief, and she was sobbing in that very first Easter day, and she went to the tomb, and in her grief in the garden, she encountered Jesus, and Jesus said her name, Mary. And she clung to his feet and worshiped him. Thomas, the skeptic, the doubter, who said, I won't believe it until I see it, he appears to Thomas. He said, Thomas, feel and look and see the scars in my hands and you can touch where I was jabbed by that spear in the side. I'm alive, I'm here. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. What happened? It was personal. They had a personal encounter with the risen Christ and that changed everything. And you see, when you have a personal encounter with the risen Christ, this fuels you with real power to face real life. That's how they changed. That's the only plausible explanation to explain their changes on an individual level, but also to explain the inception and the birth of the church. For now, it's the largest religion in the world that started with you know, a few group, uh, maybe 11, 15, 17 men and women who had no money, they had no guns, they had no power, they had no influence at all, and it's grown to be the largest movement and religion in the world. How is that possible? How is that possible? I mean, one way I look at it is through cause and effect. Causality. You know, cause, the law of cause and effect it discusses the relationship between two phenomena when one phenomenon is the cause of another phenomenon, such as kicking the ball, right? The boy kicked the ball, boom, that's the cause. The effect is the ball rolled. Cause and effect. Everything in this world, everything in our life, everything in this universe and other universes is a result of cause and effect. All of nature, all material matter, immaterial matter, we're all contingent on some cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So when you think about the existence of God, I think this, one of the strongest arguments for the existence of God, as if God needs our help, is the cosmological argument. That God is the uncaused cause. He is the only non-contingent being. So, so many times the people who want to mock God or disbelieve God in these popular books that have come out over the years, they're arguing against the wrong God. They're not arguing against the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity. So he is the ultimate cause. We look at the, the resurrection of Christ as a cause and effect. What could change these people's hearts and lives in such a dramatic way they, they went from cowering in fear to men and women of great faith and confidence. What can change them? It was the reality of the resurrection of Christ. They all died for their faith, except John. He was exiled in the Isle of Patmos. They all died. They were beaten. They were tortured. Thomas was speared to death in India. How do you explain that? How do you explain them giving their lives for this reality of the risen Christ? 
I think about, I'm old enough to remember Watergate, okay? Watergate was this giant conspiracy uh, by the President of the United States, Richard Nixon. He created these crimes, and, and then he tried to cover it up, and he had his loyal men around him that worked for him. One of them was John Dean, his most loyal and trusted ally who was involved in the scandal. They had this cover-up story they spun out there. The story lasted for two weeks, two weeks. And then John Dean turned state's evidence against Nixon. And then his friends followed. Why? Because they didn't want to be embarrassed. Why? Because they didn't want to go to prison. Think about these disciples, these early followers of Christ. They were peasants. They had nothing. Why would they go and endure the hardship, the mockery, the pain, and the toil? You see, men and women will give their lives for something they believe to be true but they will never give their lives for something they know to be false. The cause, the cause was a personal encounter, an eyewitness encounter with a risen Christ. The effect was real power to face real life. It's kind of wild, isn't it? I love history. I love to read about people in history. I, I gain lessons from people in history. But I can't introduce someone to you out of, you know, the catalog of history. I can't say you need to invite Abraham Lincoln into your life or George Mueller or Keith Green, whoever your hero is. No, because they're gone. They're dead. Muhammad's dead. You can go to, his, go to Saudi Arabia. You can go to his tomb. His bones are there. Moses and David are dead. You can go to their tomb in Jerusalem and see where they're buried. Buddha's dead. You can go find his bones somewhere over in India. Jesus is not there. He's not there. That's a historical fact, whether you believe it or not. It's factual. But the question is, have you taken that step to ask him? To ask him? to come in and to take over your life. So the resurrection is both historical and experiential. And Paul says it's his desire to know Christ and to know the power of his resurrection. And he said the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. How can you face life? This plotless life full of uncertainty about the power of the risen Christ. How can you face suffering and persecution and pushback and challenges and setbacks by the power of the risen Christ? How can we have hope in the face of certain death? It's by the power of the risen Christ. Because he is risen, we have hope for today and power and peace for tomorrow. He's really here. He's really alive. He really can change your life. He really can empower you in this very moment. You see, it's not enough to believe in God. It's not enough to believe in the history or the veracity of the Christian faith that Jesus Christ came, he died, he rose again. It's not, the, it's not enough to believe in that. You have to believe in him, in the risen Christ. That, that's, that's personal, that's personal. And that's what happened to these early followers. That's what changed their life. That's what struck a match that caught the world on fire. We know as the Christian faith and Christian church. It's a fact that this one man, this poor Jewish teacher, really did come back from the grave alive. And he really was the face of God to us.
Where do you find yourself in this story? Who do you identify with? Do you do that? You're watching a movie, you read a book. You say, you know, you can kind of identify. Who, who do you identify with in the story today? Do, do you identify with Peter? Peter felt like he had failed so many times that God would never use him. Do you identify with Mary Magdalene who made a series of poor, horrible decisions, who had a checkered past, who was covered in shame? Do you identify with Thomas? Are you a skeptic or a doubter? That's who I connect with in the story. Who do you identify with? And what if, what if this same risen Christ who restored and reinstated Peter can do the same for you today? What if this risen Christ who forgave and healed and covered Mary Magdalene could do that for you today? What if, in the midst of your doubts and questionings, that God in Christ proved his reality to you today? What if, what if you opened your heart and opened your mind to the ultimate cause of the resurrection of Christ? What effect might that have in your life today?